Man, it's a pleasure to have Kevin Churko on the podcast today. Thanks for taking the time, brother. No problem. I appreciate you, Jim. I've always uh, believed and, and heard that the most valuable people in this business are often multidimensional, multifaceted. Uh, you're a songwriter, you're an artist, you're a musician, you're a businessman, plus you're an award-winning producer with over a dozen number one hits, Junos, Grammys, Dove Awards. Um, we've all heard this analogy at times that an artist's song is a little bit like their baby. And when you're in the role you're in, you're basically involved in that process of bringing that baby to the marketplace from the point of conception. What's it like for you, because you've experienced this many times, when <clears throat> the art aligns and it's right and it's on point and, and the brand aligns and the commercial appeal is there and the song's just a winner all the way around. I mean, I'm sure that feeling never gets old. Uh, I mean, that's why you do it. I mean, really, it's it's the feeling, you know, a couple of reasons. I mean, obviously, everybody has to make a living, too. But but it's really about um, feeling that joy of, of the birth. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that analogy you just used would put me as a doctor, I suppose. Uh, you know, or the father. The birth. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, a doc yeah. A doctor. Or father. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, you know, you're arranging the birth. You're helping the patient birth their song. And you get pure joy when the birth first birth first happens. And yeah. then you get additional joy when you see the child go on to college and, you know, uh, their own lives, their own careers, their own families. So, you know, so or rather the success of that song. So, uh, you know, for me, my two most fun moments are when you say that's a good song, that's done. And the second one is going to see it live and hearing people in the crowd sing it. I mean, right. it's really hard to beat that that feeling of something that you've worked on affect thousands and thousands of lives or millions of lives, whichever way it goes. But um, that's really the why you kind of, that was the, the initial emotional stimulant for being a musician. Right. And I think there's a component of that impetus for a lot of people in this business, you know, like uh, even in my own experience as a concert promoter or producer, you know, standing side stage and, and watching the band uh, interface with the audience and that beautiful exchange of energy that you see and, and, you know, we're not involved in the intricacies of the actual art, but just understanding that you're part of putting that event together to watch those people uh, right. enjoy each other in that capacity. It's such a, yeah. such a beautiful and rewarding thing. And it kind of breaks my heart when people disconnect from that, which does happen at times. Yeah. I, I, I mean, honestly, the longer that one works in this business, you or me, I mean, the, it, you know, on one hand, the more, I wouldn't say bitter, but the more unimpressive, unimpressed that we become. But on the other hand, the longer you're in this business, the more you appreciate that pure joy, that that honest passion from an artist or a concert or, you know, the impact that music has in your life. So I always try not, not to let the, you know, the business part of it upset the love part of it, the, the joy part of it. You know, right. The music part, part of that. And, and you're very connected to that, which I really respect because... I think you've got to have this this very powerful artistic uh, initiative in your spirit. But you know, I've, I've heard you say in interviews before, and I love this line: "I can't charge you the big bucks unless I help you make the big bucks." You know, <laughs> so you you get that mandate from the top that it's like, yeah, we're all here to create great art, but it has to have some level of commercial appeal if we want it to truly transcend. I mean, everybody does it, has different agendas, you know, and generally at this point in time, because I have had a little bit of success, people come to me for that purpose. And, um, you know, I, I have to be honest like anybody else and say that if I was doing this purely for selfish, emotional reasons, I just sit at home, and make my own music. You know, I mean, I, I was an artist, I was in a band, I write my own songs. So if I'm going to help somebody else and they're going to pay me, a, I have to know what they really want out of, out of it. And B, I have to make sure I give them value. So I, you know, I, I can just carry it on. Um, so I, re I really like the fact that I'm clear with them and they're clear with me ahead of time. And a lot of times, you know, even an A&R person will call me and say, hey, you want to work for so-and-so band? My first question all the time is, well, do they want to work with me? 
because sometimes a record company, a manager, an agent will have a different view of the artist than what the art says. So I figure nothing's going to get done that's productive or good in any way if the producer and the artist aren't completely on the same path. Uh, unless you're used to fighting those battles and, and I'm really not that much of a fighter. You know, I don't like to do my due diligence ahead of time saying if you just want an art record and you don't care if the songs are eight minutes long and about topics that other people don't want to want to hear about, I'm okay with that. But just let me know that now and don't come back right. to me in six months time saying, why don't we have a two and a half minute hit? Well, because you told me you wanted a six minute art song. Uh, right. But, you know, again, I'm okay with that, too, if I want to work with the artist. It's just let's have some clear, clear goals. And, uh, it, it, you know, maybe they become clearer later. Um, but at the start of it, I like to know, like, what do you expect? Do you just want a record you like? Do you just want a re record the cool kids like? Do you want to or do you want to have a career for the rest of your life based on these songs? Do you want, you know, what kind of songs do you want? Is it a lifestyle band? Is it more of a one and done kind of, you know, hit songy kind of thing. Um, so a lot of that comes, I mean, you don't ask all those questions at the very start when you first get introduced, but I, I think, you know, it's funny that, that uh, there's one artist in par particular I don't work with, um, that their A&R person came to me and asked me if I'd do a song. They finished their record, didn't have a hit, so would I do that one song? And I said, yeah, I love that, that, that artist. Uh, but listening to this record, this record sounds like an artist's record. This record doesn't sound like one where they're even trying to do a hit song. So why would they want to work with me? So what I want you to do is get the artist to call me personally and we'll talk. So I know what they want. And of course that artist never called. And I found out years later that artist would never have worked with me. So, right. you know, I mean, there's no point in getting a bunch of creative people in a room and butting heads and, and not, all working for the same goal. I think everybody's got to be on the same page, working for the same thing for it to truly succeed. Unless the artist is just irrelevant and the A&R is calling the shots and the manager's calling the shots and the artist is just a voice. Right. And, and so I would imagine that that's a different situation. Obviously when you're working with a development artist or a newer artist uh, like Corey Marks, for example, and, and you're helping sort of refine the sound that's all already there Versus somebody like Ozzy, who's, you know, put out multiple records and multiple projects on the go. And now he's looking to evolve his sound. And so how do you sort of like set the tone to build the rapport to be able to give them suggestions of utility? Is it is it sort of just like a meeting right off the top or do they spend a few days with you? Like, how do you kind of create that rapport so that you can have the influence to bring out the best <coughs> within them? Well... That's really important to me. When I think about those two artists that you talked about, Corey or Ozzy, I mean, obviously they're very different levels of career and they're very different artists in a sense too. But, you know, but both artists. Um, with Corey, it was funny because uh, his manager approached me, um, someone you know. <laughs> yes, Louis. Louis, shout out yeah, to Louis, Louis O'Reilly. Yeah, Louie approached me to mix a song on his previous record, and I was right in the middle of a couple of records, so I couldn't, so my son Kane mixed it. So that was my intro into him. So, you know, I'm listening to Kane mix it, and we're going back and forth, and I can hear, I look, see who Corey is, I see the videos, and and that sort of thing. Uh, and then, all enough, didn't think about it for, for another maybe year or two, and all of a sudden, I'm running across, he comes up on my side feed of that song, and I click on that song going, wow, this this sounds like me who's mixing up in Canada that mixes and produces exactly like me. And then I go, wait a minute, that's like really too close to be me. And then I asked, Oh, Kane, isn't this this artist that, that you mixed? So, you know, that, if you look at how long the process was, that was like that seed was planted then. And then as I developed more along, uh, along the lines of what I wanted to do to produce somebody new and to do something new, I remembered that guy, Louis approached me again about doing some more production work and I had another look at it and go, yeah, that's kind of what exactly what I want to do. So let me talk to Corey now, find out if I'm exactly what he wants. And Ozzy was one of his favorite artists. And oddly enough, my record was one of his favorite, favorite records because he's from, you know, he's a younger man. His dad would probably like Blizzard of Oz. Uh, 
which I do too. Um, but you know, Corey knew that that stuff and he liked it. And some of his favorite songs, you know, were songs that I was a part of. So he already liked what I did. So then it's just a matter of long enough to say, <clears throat> this is how I see you. And again, Corey was different than doing the Aussie process. With Corey, we could start from square one in a, in a certain sense. I call him and say, looking at you, listening to you, hearing your stories, this is how I feel that I can help you. And then I went through, you know, some of those things. We didn't even write a song or any of that yet. And then after you get past that, yeah, I think I might want to spend three months in a room with the guy. Then, uh, then you go to the next step of he flew down to Vegas and, you know, we had a writing session with him, me and Kane. And it's like, is there any synergy at all? Is there any kind of, you know, is it fun? I mean, Honestly, at this point, I can work with a lot of different people, and I'm like anybody. I want to have fun. I, I don't want to go to work and be depressed and not like the people I'm work, working with. Corey's definitely fun. <laughs> no doubt about it. Uh, it, it. In a lot of ways, uh, and a great, great dude. So they, he came down, I think, I mean, Outlaws and Outsiders might have been the first song that we wrote. It was like, well, what I see is being your map. This is for who you are. I don't think you need to worry about appeal appealing to definitive radio i mean the general rule is that you try to do a radio song so radio is going to play it and then you get lost in the shuffle and you're not necessarily have an identity and that's no disrespect to anybody who's doing that because obviously if you know of them they have great great careers but i think with Corey, it was a little different like we want to do something that's a little bit more akin to just what we like just normal yeah. stuff to be like i do i do rock i do metal i do country uh and Corey's by who he is, he's an outlaw. So it just kind of made sense. And so that becomes, you know, m me and him getting together and Kane and saying, this is, this is our little borders. This is what we think that we want to do. And let's just do it. Let's, let's just see how good we can make it. And then that, but that's very, very different because that's us talking amongst themselves. And then we have to go to the industry and said, okay, this is what he is. This is who he is. Who's interested. And, yes. um, and then we find people interested actually in the artist versus finding, you know, the label coming to me already signing the artist and then say, do you want to do it? And I, I really like that process of being part of the identity and being part of the master plan from the word go versus the opposite extreme is Ozzy. I mean, as you, as you mentioned that he's Ozzy, I didn't really deserve to even be in that room. I was lucky I was in that room and, and, my main goal was not to not to wreck it. Uh, you know, he's got at that time he had Zach Zach Wild. You know, was his guitar player. I mean, they already have their map, and I'm just there to facilitate them. What right? Kind of in that case, it's almost more of an evolution, right? It's like it's like what yep. do we want this next record to sound like? We know how you've built this this legacy based on what you've done so far. And then and then what's the goal? How much commercial appeal do you want, or do you want to do something more introspective and and, you know, with Corey, it's it's different because, like you say, you're getting to build it from the ground up. You're getting to uh, have some input right all the way back to the, the songwriting aspect of it. And with Corey, it was so interesting because he's had, thanks to you and, and obviously his own uh, musicianship and artistry, he's converted the fans faster than he's converted the industry, which is almost like a backwards approach in this business. Usually you get the buy-in from the industry, terrestrial radio, the fans discover you via that uh, uh, modem. And then all of a sudden they're, they're in, right? Where with Corey, it was like, we're just going to put this out because it's great. The fans are going to get it. And then we're going to build backwards from that where we get the support on terrestrial. And, uh, and I think that, you know, we can credit you for that. A large part of it, obviously, Corey, too. But you found this sound that really sticks out like a sore thumb. Nobody can quite place it, but everybody loves it. Well, again, that, you know, I love what you said at the start about how the fans would find it. And my belief is always, it's never been truer than now that fans can control what they're listening to. For, via, you can take any example from TikTok to whatever. You don't necessarily have to. I mean, it's not that I don't want radio, but you don't have to have that. If people like an artist, they will champion it and they will follow it and they can hear their songs on Spotify and they can go see their shows and people can advertise. Maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 
there's only a few lanes, a few avenues you could go go down. But the, the one thing, Corey, for me, you know, my, my, uh, my methodology with Corey was basically started even a decade before where I was doing a record in Oklahoma. I was doing a heavy rock record in Oklahoma and I'm meeting everybody and I'm there for a couple months and it's like, wow, I know these people. These are people from the prairies with a different, different accent. And like, I'm learning music. These are all the same people. So what I did yeah, was you, you I grew thought, up in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Just, just for people who are tuning in, you grew up in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. What you're saying is that the people in rural Oklahoma are basically the same people you grew up around. Yeah. I mean, it's very comfortable and, you know, I could read them. They could read me. The accent was a little different. I could turn the South on if I want. No, I can't. Add a part. Out. Um, but I think the most, the most interesting thing to me was that we'd be working on this heavy rock record and then we'd go at lunchtime and we'd go get some lunch and we'd get into one guy's truck and they have a country CD. They have like a Jason Aldean album in there and we're going, you guys listen to country? Yeah. But you're a heavy rock man. Yeah, but we love country. We love this kind of country, not the other kind of country. Uh, and I said, I like both, both kinds of music, country and Western. No, I didn't say that. I said, <laughs> that's really interesting to me. And, and then you look at the, you know, how well Canadian bands like Nickelback did and do, um, it, it all just kind of makes sense that they, a lot of them were the same people. And basically the, these people are people where rock, heavy rock metal is too heavy for them. Not many people want, not many adults want to listen to some guy screaming at them, them the whole time. And country was a little bit too poppy and too sugary for for them, uh, and it it kind of is a different thing than maybe it, you know once was. So, but these are a lot of people who are just not being served. And so, I, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, what the world needs is an Eagles, or some kind of really kind of mainstreamy kind of thing that a lot of people can like, that are just kind of real songs from a real person with real experiences not too extreme either way. Now, I may sound extreme to maybe a regular country listener, or Corey may sound extreme to a regular country listener who's only grown up on country radio. But I'm not extreme to a regular person. I'm not extreme to the guy who used to go to Van Halen concerts or now goes to a Nickelback concert or any right. of those people. It's just, you know, it's actually pretty mainstream music that I think has the potential of almost everybody from country and rock liking. And that was the goal. And I knew radio wouldn't really necessarily accept it right away. But radio doesn't accept a lot of things right away. And it's really the people that have to decide. I mean, if it's one thing I've learned from Five Finger Death, Death Punch, that people decided the success of that band, not the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers still keep thinking that band's over with and every year's a bigger year and every record does better. And they still think that that band's never going to last. And it's already been, I don't know, 11, 12, 12 years. Because the people, their their fans decided, and you don't need everybody. You don't need everybody in the world. It's not a pop band. You need the amount of people that there are to have the crew that you want to have playing the kind of music that you want to play. And I think that Corey is really set up for that kind of kind of artist too. Yeah, in some ways, he's almost uh, along with your help ushered in potentially a new format within the format, right? And. Um, I love that you cited the Eagles. I think that's a great example of a band that, that was considered a rock band, but they had country hits at the time. They had pop hits at the time. Uh, a more modern version of that, even though the, the music is so much different, is a guy like Kid Rock, who you know, sort of amalgamated the best of, of hip-hop, uh, southern rock, uh, pure rock, um, some, country, you know, some country elements in there too. And when that broke... And I was early in my career when he started building his story. It was like I was working in rock radio at the time and people were like, I don't know. Like, is this is what is this? But we all knew it was good and we all knew he had a groundswell of support. And so it was just like figuring out where you were going to slot the, the particular singles in uh, that worked with your format. But you would also hear Kid Rock on the country station um, as well in his duet with Cheryl Crow at the time. So you know, Corey is sort of like the next generation of that type of artist where it's like, we can't quite pigeonhole it, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, a lot of radio programmers have confessed to me that even though they're not spinning the song in their country radio station, they're playing the record regularly in their car to and from work. And to me, that's like, that's like a shadow buy-in. It's like, okay, these guys get it. 
they just want the right song to get behind. And eventually we're going to find that, you know, and, and with Corey, I have no doubt that eventually terrestrial radio is going to see the brilliance in him because people already do. They're just looking, they're looking for a song safe enough that they can get away with adding. Well, I think that's the key thing is that at a, at a certain point, people like it or they don't. And I think that people very quickly can decide whether they like a song or not, whether they like an artist or, or not. You know, the gatekeepers are different because, you know, the gatekeepers slay like the programmers and the journalists and whatever. I mean, they don't always have pure love agendas. They have a boss. They have, um, you know, business that they have to tend to. A radio station has to not alienate people. But... I mean, honestly, a lot of times they eventually they always end up a mirror of probably what people want these days. And if people say we're going to the Corey Marks concert and it's packed and then some other bigger artist comes through town, doesn't do as well. Well, at some point you have to acknowledge that people like it and you will play it because they need to advertise from people who like it. So, right. you know, it, it's it's. I think that without you take COVID away and we'd be even an even better situation because Corey's awesome live. So he needs to get out there and play for people and he wants to get out there and play for people. And he's a guy that can pitch up at a radio station, play the song and people like it. He doesn't need 50,000 tracks back in him. I might record 50,000 tracks, but he doesn't need that. He can just sing, you know? Um, and I think that people like that kind of artist and COVID's helped that kind of artist too, in the sense that people are wanting a more legitimate artist too. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens next, next year. You know, when people have the opportunity to see somebody with Corey's energy who can play a lot of different music live. And again, you know, I go back to people like a lot of different kinds of music and people aren't as judgmental as what the industry thinks that they are. I have friends who can play, you know, I, I look at my daughter as actually a real good gauge and she's someone I play music for because she can play, she can hear if she likes it or not with, within seconds. And it's, you know, it's halfway through the first course. Yeah, it's going to be good. I say, you haven't even heard the rest of it. Yeah, but I know. And other times she'll say, that's not hitting me, me at all. And I said, but wait for the course. Now, you know, I think people are like that too. And I don't think you can tell people what they like or what they don't like. Even if they listen to it privately, even if that radio program doesn't feel they can playlist it, if he's listening to it, to me, it's a win because that means that he likes it. And I'm making it for people to like, not necessarily just to fill that, that slot in between, you know, whatever Luke Bryan and, you know, Jason Aldean. I mean, those are good slots, too. And I think Corey does fall within that slot. But sometimes you got to prove it to, to people and eventually it will be undeniable. And we'll look back on this podcast and just kind of chuckle. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a good moment. A good moment for Corey, too. He had such a great summer lined up. He had a, a 50 date amphitheater tour in the US. We had headline dates in Australia, all through Canada. And uh, so it's been a bit heartbreaking to uh, see his launch get um, mitigated by what happened with COVID. But at the same time, it's given him the ability to uh, to potentially create more from this like we all know that artists often take their pain and manifest it into art right and so he's going to write some great songs out of this and i just know that that the net benefit is going to be better for the long-term impact of his career once this sort of all plays out but you know yeah. um helping him uh, uh maintain the poor guy's sanity in the meantime is really important you you touched on on something that I think is magical and so important, but it's a bit of an overused word. And then that's authenticity. Everybody likes to throw that word around, but the truth is we all kind of really know it when we feel it. How do you, how do you break through the noise of what the label wants, what the artist at times thinks they want? Um, because you obviously gauge authenticity and, and you can probably really determine whether an artist is, talk themselves into selling bullshit or whether they are on track with something that truly aligns with how they feel. Um, how do you sort of like present that to an artist and help them see the light when they've maybe, you know, gone off the beaten path a little bit and they're, they're, they're chasing radio or their label wants them to do this or this. And, and you know that the magic is somewhere in the core of their being. How do you bring them back to that place? 
You know what? I, I actually haven't had a lot of experience doing that. It's, for me, it's always the other way around of taking someone who completely knows who they are as an artist. And for me, my job is making them att more attractive to much a wider audience. I mean, that's why people come to me, not, not to get them back in touch with their artistry. They're already artists. I mean, I mean, we don't have to use Corey. Corey, Corey is an example. There's, I mean, all my rock artists are artists. I mean, all of them, I've had literally a conversation where I will say to them, you know, one person in particular who, if he, if, if he ever watches this, he'll really chuckle. But, you know, you want to be in the cool kids club or do you want to have a career for the rest of your life? Do you want to be able to be a singer for the rest of your life and not worry about the bills being paid? You know, go in your backyard and jump in the pool. Or you right. So it's a it. similar dilemma. Hey, you're, you're sort you know, of ushering them towards, you know, getting a little bit out of their myopic bubble creatively yeah. and, and building something that's going to appeal to a broader audience. Yeah. I, I, I would say that's where my forte is. And my, my, you know, I'm able to speak to that ours because I under, I completely understand what their position is as an artist. And I love that. That's who I want to work with is someone that has a spine to do or say or play what they want. But I also want to be the guy that, that lets enough people hear that to at least give them the choice of saying whether they like it or not, whether they, they buy into that artist or not. And you can't do that if you're just, you know, if you're in this, I'm trying to look at the video. If you're in this kind of little channel, yep. tougher than it looks, you know, you're going, you're only going to find, you know, 10,000 people. If you're in this channel, you can find a million people. You can almost do the exact same thing, but sometimes it's as simple as instead of an eight minute song, let's do a three and a half minute song. Let's get let's all the best parts, parts in it. Yeah. And at the same time, you're still doing exactly what you want to do. It's just wrapping it up so that it has the best chance of giving, getting uh, appreciated by people, which will in turn enable him to, or her to do it more, to do it again and again. And that's, that's really my goal is, is that. And I think that they respect that and we, you know, I mean, I do the same artist over and over again. And I think that's because I always approach it from their interests first. This is not my interest. This is your interest. And if you truly just want to sell to 10,000 people and you want to go play shows for 100 people, we can make that up. If you want to sell for more, well, these are some of the things that you have to have to think about. And in, in the end, they always like it more because, you know, it's quality is still quality. I mean, if they don't have to compromise and they get more of a career, or more sales, bigger shows. I think that's a win. All the way around. How much does experimentation in the studio play into that process? You know, if you're if you're trying to plant the seed that you're trying to migrate their art in a direction, uh, are you willing to uh, run some tracks with your ideas intact and go, hey, have a listen to this. You know, this is what it was. This is what it looks like with a little more spit and polish on it. What do you guys think? Do you do you often um, allow them to sort of like gravitate towards it from the perspective that it's almost their idea? Well, now you're asking me for trade secrets. And, <laughs> um, That's the whole me, idea. <laughs> uh, you know what? Yes. To answer your question, it's a process. Now, I don't, you know, I think what kind of what you said there is if I just experiment on my own, I think that they're more liable to, if they don't feel a part of it, it's not them. Ownership so th is huge. Yeah. So I, th I think that it's, it's, I, I think for me, again, I have to be in a position with these guys of trust and sometimes it takes some time for them to realize I'm on their team and I'm not on the other team. Um, but it, but it has, it has to do with, I think working together and the experimentation that you're talking about, if I, if I'm producing a record from scratch, I'm not talking about if I'm just mixing something because if they send me something to mix, I'm going to put all my magic into it, send it back. I don't even want them to hear it until I have the wow factor there. And then they either go, wow, or this is not even our band anymore. We don't, we don't want this. Right. But if I'm producing somebody from scratch, that's a different kind of mental process. And that is one where let's work in this together and, you know, let's let's not take anything off the table. I, I think that's a key thing that people get too caught up in is being wrong. I mean, I would rather go, let's try a bunch of things. You can always say you don't like it. I can always say I don't like it. We can always reverse course. 
but until we try, how do we even know? And it's, and you know, my cane always says, usually it's just quicker to try it and say no, than to talk about it for three days and, and then try it. Uh, right. So, so I think that it's very quick to try. I mean, I even have a situation recently where I, I had a, you know, an acoustical little solo thing that one of my artists did. And then I sent him the version. He didn't like it. He re-recorded it at home and he said the version he liked more, you know, he didn't stop us from trying it in the studio and I didn't stop him from trying to do something better. It's not about, did I do it? Did you do it? It's just like, is it good or not? And so when you're talking about, about the sort of the psychology of producing, it's really, it's not really being secretive usually as much as it is of being inclusive. And I think that that even works out with, with a uh, disjointed band or a band with a lot of dissension in them, because I'm not there to just listen to the lead singer. I'm there to listen to everybody in the band. And if one guy who generally doesn't get a say all of a sudden gets a say and has a valid point, he's on your team. Then, you right. know? I think it's really bringing everybody at the same team as far as the artistry goes. Now, and that's right. why sometimes I like bit working with a single person more because it's a little bit simpler and easier. You know, if I'm working with a whole band that has full ownership of that band, um, I have to take into account everybody's opinion because everybody's opinion matters to me, whether it's the drummer or whether it's the guitar player. I mean, they all matter because in the end, they all got to get out there and put their names behind that and sell that for years and years and years and years. I don't have to get out there on the road and do that. They have to get out there and say, this is me. This is us. Yeah, this is a song they could be playing for 20 years, so they should like it. Exactly. And that the last yeah. thing I would want I mean, I've had situations where the singles weren't necessarily the ones the band liked. And, but generally, once it's successful, they like it a whole lot more. <laughs> yeah, they fall, they fall in line when they buy that Lamborghini. Yeah. And, in, yeah. and, in a, and, and I mean, honestly, you know, full disclosure, in a few cases, they are angry because now they have to play a song they didn't like for the rest of their lives. But, you know... Again, if it's a democratic process on the way there, they have to live with that because they had an opportunity to say no, yes, no, um, and put their case forward. And, and that's why for me, some, sometimes it might take a little bit longer to do a record. But in the end, I think the band is generally more together, more cohesive and all on the same page. Of, this is some good work that we've done and let's go sell it. Um, so, you know, I know what you're trying to say. Uh, and I've definitely had situations where I had to sort of cleverly guide an artist to the end, to the goalposts, but I really want them to want to get to that goalpost because right. you know, if Tom Brady wants to win the game, chances of him doing the right things are better than if he doesn't care about winning that game. Right. And, and his coach has to give him the tools to, uh, to win that game. And then listen, you just, you just hit a point out of the park that, um, I often preach uh, to other industry people who ask me questions like, you know, how do you influence your artists? And it's like, well, you build rapport by aligning your intent with what you hope will help the artist achieve their short term and long term goals. Right. Like if the artist really feels that you're not just trying to put your stamp on something, that you're actually listening to them and that you have. Uh, the best intent for them to succeed uh, and you're right more than you're wrong over time, you will build enough rapport with them that they will listen. They will be influenced by your opinion because they know where you're coming from. And that that's true on the business side, but also on the side that you're involved in, right? It's like artists need to feel like they're heard, that their opinions valued and that, that they matter. And, and if you can integrate that, with the overall commercial objective for the project, then you get a win-win situation. And you did mention something earlier that I, that I, I'm glad you brought up, which is that you're always making sure that you reiterate to the artist through your actions, through your words, that they know that, that they're your client, you're working on their behalf. But you mentioned, um, they might think I'm on the other team and not their team in the beginning, especially when things are fresh. So, Break that down a little bit. Does that mean the label or the industry? Like, who are the separate teams? Who are the separate factions in that process that you're referring to? Uh, okay, I got myself into a bit of a hole on that one. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have to drop any names. No names. Just just generally speaking. Well, 
just to be clear, I love everybody I work with. Um, but, you know, there's different levels of involvement and there's different sort of commitments to an artist. And I think that in general, I think let's call it a record label or a private investor, whatever takes, who's, who's ever paying the bill, right? Who's ever paying the bill, unless they're your mom or dad, which is the worst situation to be in, but unless they're your mom and dad, the person paying the bill has a right of expectation and has a right to know what they're paying for. Uh, but most of these people are only interested in the business part of it. You know, they want to make money. A record label is not, not necessarily there. Most, most labels, not all of them, but, but most, the, you know, the music industry is an industry. The record business is a business. Uh, and I'm not saying they're wrong. I would say rightly so. The record label is interested in making as much money as they can because that's generally the nature of business. Nobody wants to purposely make less money in their day or their, for their business or their corporation. Well, they so, may not be around to, to execute business the following day if they follow that mandate, right? So I, I think we can all understand it. Yes. And I, don't, I think that's why I'm a good go-between because I understand that. And I want to provide them with a record that they can make money with. We may have different ideas of how to do that. But, but, but nonetheless, if the record label doesn't make money, there's no record out next, next time. They don't re-sign you. So, you know, so they have that one most of the time. Not the indies as much because the indies are more connected to their artists, I think, uh, and have more responsibility and liability. But when you're on a major, it's like your A&R guy may, be very, may love your band. He may think that you're awesome and they want the best for you. But generally, you know, there's so many people in that process that it's a business and it's a big corporation and they're accountable to now they're accountable to shareholders and stuff too. So it's yes. a different, unlike maybe an indie label might be privately owned and then you're kind of only accountable to him and he can or her and they can do whatever they, they want. But getting back to your original point that they are, they are the them. They are the people who generally will go to an artist and say, this sucks. We need something more that we can sell. Now, that's not what an artist wants to hear. They don't want to hear their music sucks. They don't want to hear that. To them, they're hearing, you want me to sell out. Yeah, and it's like telling them their baby's ugly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants and, to hear that. And even if the baby is ugly, you still don't <laughs> want to hear that. Uh, no, there are no babies that are ugly yeah. ever. So... Uh, <laughs> So whereas the artist, you know, I, I'm a little, little generally, you know, yes, I make money the more that it sells and I want to, I'm, I'm a businessman too, but at the same time, you know, I'm not a corporation. I don't have to make a lot of money every record. I'm not in dire straits. I can choose to be a little more gracious with my time and a little bit more concerned with the artist agenda too, because the artist is generally bad at business, knows nothing about it, and is only interested in the art. Which they should be. Again, I don't, you know, it's the That's their side role. Of the equation. Yeah. And I think it was better run. The music business was better run when that was more clear. Unlike maybe sometimes now where artists are maybe more involved in their the business and numbers and their, you know, their own advertising, whether they're social marketing themselves or whatever, you know, that's taken a different shape. But anyways, back, back to your, I don't want to get going in circles here. Um, your point is, is that the artist my point is the artist comes from one point of view, the record label comes from the other point of view, and I'm the bridge. I'm the guy that can talk, talk to the label and say, I know what you're saying. So you're saying you need at least one song that's under three and a half minutes long or under three minutes long in some cases because it's a new artist and radio is more likely to hit play a shorter song from a new artist. It can't be a ballad because, you know, they got enough ballads from the premier artists. You know, all those questions I can talk to the label and then I can go to the artist. And instead of saying uh, your record doesn't fulfill all the agenda that the record company has, I can say, hey, what do you think about about doing a mid-tempo song under three minutes long? I mean, I won't say it like that, but I'll say, let's. You know, like maybe they have another 10 songs that they've, they've written. I'll choose, I'll choose the one that has the greatest chance of that. And so one could say that I'm manipulating them because I have an alter alternative agenda than what they did, which was just to create their art. But I think it's in their best interest that someone like myself that is concerned that they get to have the voice and they are able to say the things they want and are able to represent who they want can also have a career and has another record to go next, next time too. And again, this is why, you know, with 
the, all, most of the artists I deal with, you know, in one sense, it gets boring because it's the same revolving cast. But for me, it's awesome because it's so easy because they trust me and I trust them. Right. And we know each other and they can look back. And, and honestly, for me, it's even better than that because life got a lot better for me in a certain sense when there were streaming numbers, instantaneous streaming numbers and data, because that is one part of business. That's how we're all getting paid. So when an artist comes to me, the next album, and says, you know, the last album, so-and-so songs were dogs, and they didn't do well, and let's make sure we don't do any more like that. And I'm going, I used to have to say, no, I don't, I don't think they were dogs. I mean, that, that song wasn't in the top 10, but people like it, and they're requesting it. And they're going, no, I heard some guy say on the radio it, it was bad. I said, yeah, but, you know, I don't know if that's the whole picture. Now I can say, okay. And that's how I found out that radio isn't always the key to sales. I can say, look, it, here's a song that you just finished telling me did not work. But yet it's your second highest streaming song on that record. So you the can tell, measurables you know, don't lie. Exactly. That's why it's so important to integrate some objectivity into yeah. the subjectivity because artists are, yeah. you know, and I don't think this is a, a cruel generalization, but I think they're obviously emotionally driven. They, that's their job. They sort of take this chaos of emotion that they feel and they translate it into art. So they're very sensitive to uh, emotional subjectivity. But uh, I agree with you, bringing them back to the reality of the measurables and going, listen, you know, somebody might have told you this song sucked, but it's it's done five million streams in the last three weeks. That yeah. doesn't suck. The marketplace doesn't think it sucks. Exactly right. And I think that they it's OK still not to want to do that song again. Right. If you don't care what your numbers are and you don't care about that. I mean, I'm complete. If you don't want to do that song because you don't like it, let's not let's make sure we don't do something like that. But let's not make that choice based on the success of the song because the song was successful. And one time a band even left it off their greatest hits. And I'm going, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, that here's the numbers and people play it. And yet you're not even including it. I, I don't get it. But, you know, I don't have to get everything. I'm there to help make music, not necessarily sell it. That would be, well, in a sense, your job because view live events and whatever. Right. I mean, that's how a lot of sales are too, right? Um, but, uh, but it's wonderful now that when they say yes or no to a song and then I can instantly bring up on my publishing app, the most, my, the, the most popular songs, that's one metric too, is how much money did the, the publishing make? And I can say, well, that's actually your top track. Um, or it's easy to go to Spotify and quickly just look at the stats or go to iTunes and sort by popularity. I mean, now you, you know, it's, you can't, you have to use some smart kind of uh, reading of these charts because if a song wasn't a single, you can't put in the same boat as a song that was a right. single. So you can't it's compare. It's not a fair comparison. Yeah. And if a song was a pre-release, well, then that's different too. But if you're looking at catalog songs and somebody says this song wasn't bad and it was the most streaming catalogs, call it a catalog song on that record, don't tell me it didn't serve its purpose. People play right. it. People liked it. You may not have liked it, but which means we don't have to do it. But let's do it for that reason that you don't like it. Let's not do it for the reason that it wasn't a successful song. So right. data for me is important because it gives me a little bit more of a fundamental truth teller instead of my feelings. Because I don't want to let my feelings get in the way either. And I will tell them this song did really well. I really didn't like it that much. I prefer we don't go in that direction. Uh, but, so I got to I have to keep myself honest too, and disclose right. that too. But we're either making choices by business reasons or for artistic reasons, or or generally somewhere in between. And I think that's the best place where everybody can satisfy their artistry and have lives and careers. And of course, those goals change as they get older. And I've been able to watch some of my artists because I worked with them for for years and years. Watch as their interests change too. You know, from especially in the metal world, when you're that metal guy and all you want to be is the cool metal dude, and eventually you want to have kids and have a family, and you know, your your goals can sometimes change. <laughs> right. And as artists age, sometimes their their sound evolves and the subject matter that they're covering in songs changes, right? Like that's yeah, that's your also part of the good. process. Yeah. Now you're obviously a very approachable guy, you're very humble, you've had a lot of success across uh, multiple domains you've won a number of awards you've worked with some massive bands 
how much of a of a process has it been for you personally to really work to keep your ego in check as you're working artist to artist on projects? I mean, I would imagine at times you, you do struggle where it's like, listen, I know what I'm doing. This is what we need to do. And there's probably a part of you that that is aligned, obviously, with the best intent for what's best for the artist. But I would imagine there are conflicts at time that you need to manage internally because you've had so much, so much success. And sometimes you're de dealing with an artist who maybe isn't at your same level, but they, they're really firm on what they want to do. Yeah. I mean, if you want the complete, honest, Kevin Shurko, the Canadian Kevin Shurko, honest kind of guy is that it's actually more and more difficult to keep the ego in check as one goes forward, because you see the successes, you see the failures, and you have a different perspective, both in artist careers and in your own career too. What did you do well? What did you not do well? Now, if you're successful, then you tend to overvalue your own opinion and or maybe properly value your own opinion. But I can pretty much tell pretty quickly if a song it has legs, if it doesn't have legs. And if the artist differs with me, it can get pretty frustrating. Uh, because and by the way, I, I just want to say, I don't think that's an anomaly to your role as a producer. I think agents, managers, promoters, they also deal with that where they, they've got certain levels of pattern recognition after doing this for many years and they feel like they know the right way. And, and so it's, it's, it's good that you're giving us this insight because I think it applies across yeah. a bunch of domains. I mean, I just have to put it out there straight, and and I'm sure if you had some of my artists, uh, you know, interviewed on here at the same time, hopefully you don't have anybody, right? But if you had the special guest that's worked with me for ten years, they'd probably be able to tell you. I know the different phases of Kevin Churko, producer Kevin Churko, because in the right. beginning, in the beginning when you have no leverage, and not only that, you just don't have the knowledge or experience, you tend to be a little bit more accommodating until you see some of those things fail and some of those things su succeed. And because I work with a lot of artists, not one artist, I get a good feel for what's worked and what hasn't worked generally. So as you get that information, some of the same artists come back to you and then you might be a little bit more, more resilient or, you know, one thing. Maybe I even just a bit more tactful about how you present your, your narrative, right? Right. At that's in the middle stage, you're more tactful. And then as you yeah. get onto the later stage, it's like your patience starts running out because you've seen the song and dance and you go, I'm sure for you, it's the same thing. It's like, you know, when you're talking about the shows, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, I have to keep, it's really my patience that kind of goes down. And that's what I have to constantly remind myself is that five years ago, I wouldn't have said it like that. Five years, I would have taken some extra time to explain it. Or five years ago, I would have you know, but now you're going to really, I, you know, you almost know the script verbatim and uh, you just kind of, and, and you've, in a sense, when you work with the same people, I, you know, I feel when you proved yourself that most of your intuitions were right in the past, why are we having this conversation again? I right. mean, we, you just had your biggest hit, which was written in this room or whatever. And now you're second guessing every, everything, you know, so you tend to, Lose the patience. So, you know, I'm like, I'm human like anybody else. And I like to look back. I've had a lot of failures though, too. And, and just because I've had a lot of success doesn't mean I'm always right. And doesn't mean that there's not going to be that anomaly. I think the song is not going to do well. And all of a sudden the bridge is on a TV commercial and that's enough to push it over the edge. Or it was a pre-release and they had an awesome video. I mean, there's a lot of ways that I can be wrong and, or I can just be literally wrong. Uh, and I have, I've been wrong about other people's hits. Whenever I hear a new song, you know, generally most of us in the business go, well, that's never going to work. And all of a sudden it does work. Uh, or that's going to be a monster and it's not a monster. So nobody has all the keys. Nobody has all the knowledge. Nobody ha is always going to be right. I think the key thing is to work with people who are mostly right and to trust those intuitions and, but yet be open to being wrong and be open to, okay, the artist really wants to do this. Let's do it. And that's why I like to, you know, I literally tell the artists, you know, in some cases, you know, this is kind of your, more your song. I'm, this is the art song. So you get to do whatever you want. I will not, 
take your eight minute song and cut it down. I will not make sure you get to the chorus by a minute and a half. I will not make sure the intro is only 15 seconds. It's not a radio song. You can do anything you want. You can have any co guest you want, uh, you know, but these four over here, I'm, you know, just give me the benefit of the doubt on these, these ones and the rest of them, you can do whatever you want. Uh, oh, I, I don't say, you know, I don't say that. I don't say the rest of them, you can do whatever you want, but in some cases, you know, if the record company is coming to me and saying, I want a hit, then you have to be prepared to give the artist that right that says, I want something I truly love to the depths of my being. That's why they do it. You can't deny them that feeling. You can't deny them. And that's why I don't believe in, in an album full of singles. I mean, the best artists throughout time don't have... 10 hit songs. I mean, some of them do. If it's, you know, if, if they're like that, if that's their goal, then great. But the artists that I like, when you used to listen to a Queen record, you'd hear, let's call them like two or three amazing radio songs. And then you'd hear a mandolin song that does nothing. I mean, A Night at the Opera is the definition of an unorthodox hit record. That's what I would rather be doing. I mean, I'm not saying I do that, but, you know, that shows you that you don't, every song doesn't have to be the same same agenda and there's a lot of wiggle room on albums now as streaming has changed it to more song based maybe that's not something to take into consideration but at the same time i think if a fan is a true fan uh even if they found you by way of the hit song because the hit song the radio song is just an advertisement of who the artist is so if they tune into the artist and like it they're still going to like that acoustic song they're still going to play that that's going to go onto their playlists you know, it's not going to chart on anybody's chart, but they'll still like that. And they'll might be more endearing to you as an artist if you're more diverse and don't always just have three and a half minute ditties with hand claps. In them. Not right. that I'm saying hand claps are bad. I use them many times. But you know what I'm saying? It doesn't always yes. have to have whistle and hand claps in order for that artist who liked the song with whistle and hand claps to to stream even more i mean as you like an artist you start streaming their catalog songs more and more so if those songs are good and if those songs have integrity you will go on to longer living lives because now we're finding out with the streaming data and again it's so wonderful now to get this 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 in info that heritage artists or say artists uh existing let, let's call it rock music now numbers streaming numbers went up amazingly over the last year versus modern day pop hits did not get the same increase in plays that catalog songs did or that artists songs did because so, people are reaching back deeper into catalogs because they're falling in love with the artist and they're really interested in what that artist has to say holistically yes and they bought yeah yeah exactly i mean that that'd be the they're actually a fan of the artist instead of the song and the better music that artist has in its catalog meaning deeper but the more likely they're there to be there in 20 years. I mean, can you imagine being the e the Eagles right now where they first sold on vinyl and cassette and and then CDs came out. They sold the entire cab catalog log again and then streaming's out and people are listening to it all over again because the wonderful about streaming is if you put in, I put in a Nora Jones into, into a Pan Pandora station one time and I got all these Eagles songs I hadn't heard for years. And guess what? I'm streaming those songs now too. So, uh, which is why, you know, we've mentioned them a couple of times now, because it's like, wow, that's really amazing that I'm playing that Eagle song just as much as I'm playing a current song. And, and when that translates live, there's some real benefits to that too. And I've, I've talked to Corey Marks a little bit about this. Uh, you know, it's like, Corey, when you do go out and finally get the opportunity to play live, what you're going to find is people are going to be singing along, not only with the singles, but with the album cuts. <clears throat> Right. And I've seen that with with some of the left of center country artists that I work with. Kip Moore is a great example. Right. Like Kip goes out and he plays. He didn't play a shit ton of covers. He doesn't even play all his singles, but he goes deep into those records. And what you will find are some of the most magical moments in that live show is when he plays a favorite album cut, because yeah. those people aren't just there because they heard him on the radio three times and they bought a ticket. They're invested in him. And that's how you create legacy. Yeah. I, th I think I think that's really that says it as, as well as I could ever say it is that when when you like an artist and maybe you got attracted to them with the advertisement which is that radio song and you go see them live and all of a sudden they pull out an album track and you're asking somebody you know I've done done this many times you're you're asking your partner is this their song or a cover song 
because you like it that much. You can't believe that it's their song. This must be a cover song, right? No, that's their song. I said, I've never heard it. Well, it's album track number nine or something like yeah, that. Yeah, totally. It was never a single. Well, that person goes home and they listen to that song and go, wow, that's an amazing song. I wouldn't have heard this unless I saw them live, but now that I've heard it, I'm a complete fan and that goes into their playlist. And that's the wonderful thing about playlists now too, is that you can keep track of those playlists. It's not like make, it's not even like making a mixed CD or a mixtape because uh, at any time you can see it. You can't always have your binder of CDs when you used to have, when everybody used to rip right. music for free and you know who you are. <laughs> um, when you used to rip it for free and put it on a CD and then you can go out that CD there. Now you don't, you have to have your phone. And so for me, if I go out there on my, on my, uh, on my patio later, I might play hotel California four times. Now, if I had to have that mixed CD that had that, I wouldn't probably play it at all, you know? So good for Eagles, maybe bad for some current artists because it changes, it makes it a little bit more challenging, but that's why you got to think in a different way. And that's why, you know, I mean, without getting too deep into the business side of it, you know, there's there's a little bit of a question as what's more important to have higher monthly listeners or having less monthly listeners, but more engage, engagement, higher streaming numbers. And some people will say, well, monthly listeners because we're reaching way more people. And, you know, honestly, that's probably true. But a lot of my bands have less monthly listeners, but those monthly listeners aren't just playing back in black. Those monthly listeners are playing album tracks they're playing it on high rotation playlists you know they're in super the, fans in, in 20 years time they're still going to be playing those songs whereas a person that, that played that one hit song you know i i shouldn't say a song like like say call me maybe people are going to be playing that song in for the rest of the time it's a great track she has other great tracks too but you know people aren't probably going to be finding those as as much um uh, Whereas if, you know, some artists like Corey, I mean, Corey can dig out whiskey and wine in 20 years and people are going to love that song and they'll go back and that song will become part of the streaming. And it's a very different song than what the singles are or what the videos are. Um, so I, th I think that that's, you know, I mean, who knows how that's going to go. But all I can say is that my a lot of my bands stream really well and they have less monthly listeners than people with hits, like bigger hits. You know, right. Right but fewer bigger hits. And so you can have a lot of people listening to one song, but I think the goal is to have maybe fewer people listening a lot to a lot of songs. And at least that, that's the way I think of an artist. And eventually you become a queen. Eventually your music is so good and it's true that that's the time and there's a movie out and that reinvigorates your numbers and sales again. And, you know, whether it's Johnny Cash, Queen, I mean... Willie, Willie Nelson. I mean, these are people that, that worked hard, not always about having a hit single, but worked hard, released a lot of music, kept touring, actually had songs about actual things, actual events and or real emotions. Uh, I, I think that's going to win the, that's going to win in the long, long run. Yeah. And it speaks to the, the importance of the, the relationship that, that needs to have some depth to it between the consumer and the artist in order to build real legacy, right? Like um, you're right. You can have one hit wonders and those songs will live on in infamy, but how many of those people are going to be compelled to stream the entire record or multiple records from that artist, right? That's always the question. And it's not that we don't all want those massive, uh, culturally pervasive songs, of course, that's great. But it's better to have an artist, I, I agree with you, where people are like, they're in love with the single, they're in love with the album, they're in love with the artist, they're willing to buy a concert ticket, they're willing to uh, buy merch. There's more conversion there for sure. Now, as a producer, if you were to give some advice to young producers who are entering the game, would you say it's more important to develop a proprietary sound that's very much uh, you, or is it is it better to be a bit more diverse and a bit more able to contribute better to any particular artist from any particular genre, or should you should you look to just be a master of your thing and stay in your lane? Like, what would be your advice to somebody who's trying to get into it and trying to make impact, but they don't really know where to start and they don't really know where to refine themselves? Uh, I would say a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is take the success where and when you can get it. And that means maybe not having the agenda that you just mentioned. On the other hand, 
you can't not think about it. You can't not think that, will I be doing this genre for the rest of my life? Which is okay if you're successful. If you're not successful, well, you got to try other things. But, you know, answering your question in a different way, I mean, the producers, it all depends if you're talking about whose interest is at heart. If the artist's interest is at heart, you want to blend into the wall and just make sure they have some great, great songs. If you're specifically, if I'm answering this for producers, obviously you want to have an identity because right. that means for people to get that, they have to come to you. There's and not, then you can you be know, a little bit more selective about the projects you're involved in too at some point as you evolve. Well, you can be more selective. And if your intuition is right, you can, there's less choices to be had, but you're making the right choices. And, you know, my, you know, the guy who worked for Mutt Lang, he was the prime example of that. I mean, if you look at his catalog versus a lot of other producers, he didn't do near as much of a body of work, but everything was freaking awesome and everything was a hit. And he had an identity and he had a sound and the band signs up to it or they don't. Um, Sometimes they didn't work with him again, but he did the biggest album that they had. So uh, in that case, he had an identity that, that he could change. You know, ACDC isn't exactly Brian, Brian Adams, but the threads of it are the same. Um, so there's that kind of producer. But on the other hand, you know, so, th so that's just my personal taste. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm from that club. Whereas a, a, pr a producer like Rick Rubin is not that guy. He sits on the couch and every band is different and every band kind of does their own thing. And he's a little different style of producer who's been extremely successful, you know, depending on how you rate a producer success, be it plays, be it money, be it. I mean, I don't even know how to rate. There's no like scale like that. But some would say that he's one of the biggest producers and he probably never picked up a, a guitar once. And all he did was, I mean, I don't know what he did because I wasn't in the in the room. But that's a different kind of philosophy, which is just as legitimate and just as valid as the producer identity model. And in some cases, better, because then you can change w without worrying about it. You know? Yeah, in Rick Rubin's case, you can do Red Hot Chili Peppers or Johnny Cash American Recordings. Totally yes. different projects, but you he found the magic in both of those situations to make yes. them maximized. Yeah. And if you're good at doing that, I mean, that's a different kind of skill set than say, than, say, some other more identity producers. But, um, you know, if I was being completely honest, that's probably a safer way to, way to go. But me liking producers as artists, so to speak, and, and not just Mutt, but there's a lot of other guys, too, that I look at. And every time they do a record, it's a different band and it sounds different, but I can still hear the guy doing it. I like that because I'm a producer. So I like, you know, those, those are the guys in my club. Uh, so I like to hear what they're doing and see how they evolve, too. And, and uh you know, as far as success wise goes, if you're asking me, what would I tell producers? I would say that you, you know, first of all, just get good and then take the success where it happens. I mean, honestly, uh, even if it's a genre in, in some cases, you know, maybe I was a little better at producing kind of heavier rock records because, you know, I didn't listen to them as frequently as maybe some other guys in the genre. So to me, it's like, well, yeah, I get why it's awesome and I get why people like it. But how do we make the people that don't like heavy rock also like it? And so maybe I was better at that because I listened to a lot of other music too. And even now, I mean, I listen to a lot of heavy, heavy music, but I also listen to a lot of light music. I listen to every, everything because I just love music in general. That doesn't mean my records sound like everything I listen to. And that doesn't mean... That, that but it probably does inspire the odd idea that's that's translatable to your world every once in a while. It absolutely does. I mean, and even when you're talking about selecting covers, I mean, I have an agenda of how I select cover songs. You know, the bands that I work with have been pretty successful, you know, with choosing covers. And it's not me. Most of the time it's the artists choosing, choosing that and I'm just helping them. So I'm, I'm not taking credit for any of that. All I'm doing is saying I acknowledge why they worked and why they didn't work. And I think, I think that's a key thing that I tell producers mostly is try to really understand why something works or why it doesn't work, because then you can repeat it. And there's been a lot of producers or a lot of artists throughout time that they get lucky. They touch on a sound that people love and it's not a brain thought process and awesome. And I say, great. But unfortunately, I didn't get lucky. 
you know, some of us have to just trial and error and work and fail and succeed and fail and over and over again. And I think it's better, quicker done if you're conscious of that effort and conscious of, okay, that song I thought was going to be hit, it wasn't. Why was it? Even if the answer is, well, the label didn't put any money into it, which is generally what people like me would say. Uh, and sometimes it's true, but sometimes it's not yes. true. Some, some, sometimes the song just didn't connect. Uh, and I've had a couple of those where I go, I cannot understand why that isn't a number one song. And, you know, so it, if I'm confused, you know, everybody else has a right to be confused, too. Uh, and a right to be right or wrong. I mean, a lot of times you can't. A lot of times the things that I said would never be su su successful are. But I, again, I think it's a little bit of a, the probability of those things happening. Um, and uh, you know, I like to think my probability is pretty, pretty high. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. I mean, if you look at your pedigree, it just doesn't lie. It's, it's getting back to that objectivity versus the subjectivity. And I'm sure there's times where, you know, you being a perfectionist, you're probably extremely hard on yourself. Um, that's, that's typically a common trait among people who really strive high performers and perfectionists. But, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to step back for a minute, take a look at your legacy, take a look at what you've accomplished and make sure you reconnect with the gratitude of that too, which, which is, it's important to keep you fueled and moving forward. Yeah. You know what? I'm, man, I'm one of the lucky ones. That's all I can say is yes, I worked extremely hard. And so I wouldn't even take that away from myself. I won't be humble about that. It takes hard work and it, and it takes a lot of commitment. That's just honest. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it takes a lot of commitment. And I've seen less committed, more talented people n not succeed in the same way that I have. I mean, I like to think a lot of my success is because I'm the last man standing kind of attitude is that, you know, I might go down, but I'm, I'm going to keep getting up over and over again until the other guy's going, going down. Or, I mean, you don't have to wish poorly on somebody, but you know what I'm right. saying is that is that it is important for me to persevere. Now, sometimes if you don't have all the pieces of the puzzle or you're missing a little piece of luck, maybe you're still not going to succeed. So you shouldn't let it rule your life if you don't accomplish what you want. Uh, but, you know, I've worked very hard for it and I'm and I'm very grateful for it, especially in this in this world where, you know, I mean, I'm 52, so I've seen you know, a lot more talented people than me not not do as as well by any metric. So, you know, I'm happy. But sometimes it's it's some of the little things that we've been talking about that it's it's not always pure musical talent that wins. It's not always a good business sense. It's like a, a weird combination of all those things, people skills combined with resilience. You know, I'd have to say that most of my artists have succeeded. And this is another piece of advice that I'll give to producers about who you're picking out. And if you have the luxury to be able to choose your artists, I can tell you that every one of my artists that have been successful chose me overruling their record label and management <laughs> in a sense that, um, you know, their management didn't want to use me or their producer, I'm mean, sorry, their producer, their label in many cases tried to campaign against me. Um, Luckily, they had a spine, and luck, lucky for me that they had a spine, and in many cases for themselves, you know. And so they said, "No, this is what our vision is. This is what we want." And I've had also artists who wanted me and eventually caved to their their label or their manager. And unfortunately, I I put a lot of those in the "Where are they now?" category. So you don't want to be a self serving artist who's not listening to advice because you need that advice from your team. But you also need to be able to say, I believe in this, because if you believe in it, you'll do better than somebody who says, well, OK, I'll go along with the boss, but I don't like it. You know, that's not really a recipe for success. Um, right. And so you can your, your level of of spine, as you put it, or the mandate is only as powerful as your vision. Yeah. Right. So if you have an indelible vision for what you want, it's so much easier to be convincing and if you don't, if you're just like searching for fame, but you're wishy-washy about how you get there as an artist, you're much easily uh, taken off the path as to what you might actually want to accomplish in this game, right? So I, I think that's great advice. You yeah. have to really get it. And, and the people who seek you out know what you're known for. They understand your track record. And 
they're willing to put their reputation on the line to let you roll the dice on them because they believe in it. And uh, it's, it's difficult if you have an artist who just wants to be famous and they don't really know what they want. You know, that that's, that's a tough road to hoe, you know, and I'm sure you've challenged a lot of artists over the years to go like, fuck man, what do you want? Like, what do you want this record to say? What kind of a statement yeah. do you want to make? What do you want in 20 years? What do you want people to say about your career? Right. And, yeah. and if, if they know what that is, much better chance they're going to come out of that studio with a great record. You know, th that's, that's the whole key. The whole key is a great record. And to this day, I mean, I'm a kind of a producer. I work for people. Okay. I'm not producing my own records. I work for the artists. Um, in fact, I don't work for the label. Technically I work for the artist. The label may, may pay me, but it's really the, I feel that the artist in a sense is my, my boss. So it's very important to me what the artist wants to do. And it's very important to me that they want to be with me. And I think that their loyalty to me has also uh, echoed with my loyalty to them as well. And from my ability to say, yeah, you wanted me when nobody else did. So I'm here, you know, let's, but, but I'm also not a producer that just is, takes a shotgun approach and say, let's do 30 songs and pick the 10 best songs. Right. I'm more, you know, I know a lot of artists do that, you know, and A&R guys and managers and agents like that too, because yeah, you would think the probability is higher. If you got 40 songs to choose from on a record, you think the probability is higher of having the 10 awesome songs. But it again, to me, it's not just about having 10 awesome hit songs. It's about building an, an artist. And because I believe in, I believe in lightning in a bottle without doubt, but I believe more so success comes from the effort. And that if you take 12 songs and you keep working on those 12 songs and they keep getting better and better, I th and it represents you, that's probably better than just doing 40 half-ass songs and just picking the 10 that seem to work out better naturally. Plus, I want to know how those 10 got to be the best song. So I want to really work hard, hard at that, that too. Um, but, you know, I think the artist has to have a certain kind of backbone, uh, but at the same time, be open to, you know, the work of others and producers. All the jobs that I've lost, you know, that I wanted, um, I look back and go, yeah, you know what? That probably never would have worked. I probably wasn't right. the right guy. And, uh, or I wouldn't have wanted to make a record like that. So they chose the right guy. Um, so I, you know, even now, you know, even now I don't, I don't get certain jobs that I might, I might want. Uh, I never look at it as, as a negative thing because honestly, all my best jobs have been ones that have come, come to me. And it's really about the job coming to me and, um, and me doing a, as good a job for them as I can, because if they come to me, they want me and, uh, which makes it easier. And so then it's like, how can I hit this out of the park? And if I can't hit it out of the park, sometimes I'll even say no, because even if they want me, if I don't feel that I can really do what they're thinking I can do, you know, I, it's just going to be a fail. I'm, I'm not here to fail. <laughs> I'm here to, I'm here to that, succeed. That is an understatement for sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, given what you've been able to co accomplish and congratulations on all of your success. Um, it's Thanks. so exciting to see that you've been able to continue that and march it forward. Thanks again for the contribution too. not only to the, to, to the music and the people you've worked with, but taking the time on this podcast to chat with everybody, open the door a little bit to your process. I hope that wasn't too uncomfortable or nerve wracking, um, but it's uh, it, such great content here for new artists, other industry people who might be interested in your process and what you do. So I really appreciate you um, dispensing this valuable information. Well, I appreciate you arranging to have this done and arrange your own podcast. I'm sure it's going to be amazing. Uh, I do listen to pod podcasts. I think th I think they're awesome, you know. And I think that the these kind of things are really important for people to hear opinions, frank opinions from you and you and me. And you know, maybe I can't say everything the same way I'd say it if it wasn't a podcast. You know, you can hint to enough things that people get legitimate good info from people doing it rather than just from some press release or magazine article or something like that. I, I think the back and forth, someone like yourself, knowledgeable person asking me questions, even though our jobs are very different, um, you know, in a sense, we're, we work with each other. So we have to understand each other and the artists have to understand those roles, too. And so I, I, I think this is great and, and, I, and I wish you the best. Awesome. Thanks, man. Perfect way to wrap it up.
All right. So we are going to wrap it up right here. Thanks again for taking the time, Kevin. Okay, cool.